Um, but Leveson saw this as well, and he argued in his first uh, recommendation in this area for there to be a British-type First Amendment rule, and that was opposed by the press, okay, because it was Leveson's idea. Okay? And it's a tragedy. We're still campaigning for that. I won't, it sounds like Brendan, so he's not against everything that Leveson said. Finally, I just want to talk a little bit about what, uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about that. Chris has already given some information. Leveson didn't argue for any state regulation, although you'll see that read, and that's another false fact. Now, if you knowingly say something false, it's a lie, but let's assume that the collected journalists and much of the media just haven't read the Leveson report. Okay? It's certainly not giving ministers any power like they have over, I don't know, export licenses. That's, that's state regulation. It's not state regulation. It's not even statutory regulation. That's often. That's setting up by law an independent, in my view, not as independent as it should be, body to regulate, for example, television. Okay? Television is regulated. Television, the chilled, inadequate, non-investigative people that found, that, that exposed Jimmy Savile when the press had years to do it, even after he was incapable of suing due to um, uh, uh, a heart arrhythmia uh, called death. Um, it would be preposterous that the press could claim that even statutory regulation chills press journalism, but actually, we oppose that, it's not appropriate for the press, and Leveson didn't propose it. He proposed another go at self-regulation, but he said two things. It has to be effective, it has to give remedy people who need remedy, and it has to be independent. And the PCC was none of those, to put it politely. And in order to check that it's effective, uh, and oh, also he said that it's voluntary. So the Desmond problem of people just walking out of the system if they don't like it, is not the same, okay? So unlike some countries, democracies in Europe, the Finns and Denmarks of this world, that require people in the press to join a self-regulator, this is voluntary, so it's a very moderate proposal. But it would have this stamp, if <coughs> they wanted to, from an auditor. And that auditor <coughs> itself had to be independent of politicians and, uh, and would have to check that the regulator, the self-regulator, was independent of politicians. And it's incentivized. So if you get the stamp of approval from this independent, non-political body, then uh, you... Uh, will never have to pay court costs if sued in the High Court, because you're offering a free uh, and low cost to yourself arbitration system uh, to deal with complaints. So you are unchilled by uh, oligarchs who want to sue anything that moves and can cost you a lot of money even if you win in the court because you're not going to remember this body. Uh, similarly, um, <clears throat> you're exempt from exemplary damages. Exemplary damages exist currently for libel, newspapers, they have that risk. If they join this body, they're in, immune. And the only people immune from exemplary damages are press who are a member of this body. Okay? There's a flip side. If you're not a member of this body, if you said you're not prepared to accept the need for, for independent and effective self-regulation, not even that, then you're going to pay the cost of someone with an arguable case taking you to court as they must because you deny the arbitration. So what we have is incentivized voluntary, independent self-regulation. And politicians are banned from the system, so the idea that there's any political control here is preposterous. The recognition panel is appointed independently. Well, the, the independent commission of the public appointments independently appoints an independent appointments commission, which independently appoints uh, an independent recognition panel that then checks through an independent system whether an independently appointed independent self-regulator, where the Appointments Commission also is independent, and politician free, is independent, okay? Now, I don't know if you can spot a theme there, but it's not politicians. In contrast, as Chris said, the press's version, produced by a Tory peer, Lord Black, with the assistance of another Tory peer, Lord Hunt, who runs the PCC. So the recognition panel will be run by a Tory peer, as a matter of the political party, to, con to, to look to investigate a self-regulator run by another Tory peer, assisted by a former Labour cabinet minister and another Tory peer. And these people are saying the politician free system set up by the Royal Charter has too many politicians involved. I mean, mathematically that's wrong, okay? Because it's 4-0, just on named people. 
these are factual people. They actually, there are facts of life, these people. They exist, you can point to them, you can touch them, if you prick them, they bleed. So, um, I'm not advocating that. No, indeed. <laughs> So what you can see is both that it's a very vegetarian option that Leveson has proposed, and the politicians have finally delivered. And remember, Leveson has to, in a democracy, when it's set up under the Inquiries Act, report to Parliament. He couldn't report to the ether and see it implemented. So politicians had to decide whether to implement it or not. And at least they said yes. They didn't say we're picking and choosing. That would be political interference in the recommendations. They implemented it. And they implemented it not through the clear statutory route that Chris prefers, but through the more independent of politicians' route to independence, full independence of politicians, which is, which is the Royal Charter. And yet still, the vested interests of the press think that they, that's too much. And it's preposterous. And uh, obviously we'll have time to explore this in questions, but you can be reassured that there's no one from our side that wants to see anything other than a fair system of redress within a free and accountable press. Thank you. Thank you.
The new, second quote, part of this. Uh, the new model man, he will make mankind anew, will be remade from the innermost parts to the new outward forms. Any guesses? Any, any? So the, the, these are both talking about the remade, transparent heart, remaking the little person. Any guesses? Any guesses? A medium pattern. No, the first one is Robespierre, and the second one is Stalin. <laughs> um, that's to say, I think that there is another right that we need to consider, which is, it seems to me that actually this is one of these extraordinary modern battles that's going on, and it's going on around, uh, very interesting actually, around Snapchat, it's going around Spotify, it's going around the Lanson, it's going around um, Trolling, it's going, let's call it Trolling, what happens to the media, which is, Defining the difference between uh, the private money and, uh, and what is legitimate to make public or private money. Um, and it seems to me that where there is, I mean, I worry on one hand actually about people who send people emails. Um, I, I always worry about them more. I don't think they care about victims, they can't really bear it, though when you're near them, it's pretty horrible. But I do worry about the act of sending, what that does to you when you actually send. Um, something that you could never say to a person in the public. Um, but I also worry about the totalitarianism of, 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 the, in, of the, all, the one thing we know about totalitarian systems, all of those that we have seen, is that they have demanded private obedience within people's hearts to public systems of, of uh, surveillance. Um, like, um, George Orwell. Uh, makes that very clear, nobody clearer about the need, need of freedom of speech. But what does, Winston, what, what does Winston Smith preciously hide? What does he buy in 1984? He buys an empty notebook, which is an illegal one to buy, in which he keeps a diary. And that diary is what he hides, which is, and he is, as it were, arraigned for having a diary, because that diary is, as it were, the moment in which he is a private person. He is genuinely private. My contention is that, um, and in fact, I recommend you go and look at uh, Orwell on the Line and Unicorn, and he discusses some of the balances between the public and the private with great uh, uh, acumen and facility. So I think that um, there is no absolutist right for anything. There is, they're always tempered. Rights are always in contention with each other. The notion that I mean, if people have, if people have said uh, that if they have acted legislatively to say that you know, dogs must wear pink dresses but their own dog wears a blue dress or, you know, there's, there, there are things that as it were people have done in public um, have made public choices that then they hypocritically uh, uh, act out differently, perhaps in private, then that may be of public interest. But I don't think that you can have a society which is decent without private secrets. Do you have any secrets that you don't want to tell somebody? This makes you a person. The novel is uh, invented really in the 18th century, is a narrative which has huge moral imprimatur. Novels are very moral things. Um, they are also about the inner narrative, the unknown narrative of the characters. So I think that you can't just go for, as it were, um, press freedom. And I think that the notion of freedom is being very abused. Um, but we constrain our notion of freedom in all sorts of ways. I cannot hit somebody without that. My freedom to hit is somewhat limited. We uh, constrained hate speech a very long time ago now, and that seemed to me uh, a civilized constraint. Uh, we constrained the rights of businesses not to employ pregnant women. That was seemed to me a very useful constraint, which my generation uh, did very well at, and I hope future generations. But you know, you, you, you could be sacked until a labour bill. For me. So we, we constrain the rights of companies. That's, that's what you're looking at. And I do not recognise, 
I really, you know, how do you make your language? Um, the Twitter mobs of popular press haters. Um, over the weekend, somebody who I've known for a very long time, actually, a very modest, heavy, vigorous man, uh, Mike Gibson, who run a little tiny thing with no money called Media Wise, which dealt with not big press victims, so his side. So it's very interesting, it's got very big. I mean, so, you know, uh, 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 which actually had 20 years ago begun to find, you know, these people just say, it's people who have been done over by their local newspaper, not these big stories. And, my, and Mike Jackson is a very laborious man. Um, a story was run that, with a headline saying, you know, EU money goes into academic who constrains press freedom. He so had had some money from the EU, and he did go on running media-wise, but that wasn't, that wasn't an accurate story. So the, my observation is that the attack dogs, um, and indeed all of, all of the concessions of the press, the press have got very, you know, very close to what they want, and I think got their niggas in the um, And the hysteria which is coming the other way against which one of the case puts the steady evidence of the sense of the uh, public opinion have demonstrated very, very systematically that the British public repeatedly um, thinks that the press should be a little constrained. They probably feel a little bit miserable about having enjoyed some of the stories that they now know led to, you know, led to, it was quite impossible to enjoy a story or, and feel horrified and enjoy a story about Minnie Dalla, and then to realise that the way in which you described that meant that you had colluded in something really unpleasant, <coughs> and then to deny it. The British public, whenever polls, thinks that there should be a bit of press regulation and they should do it themselves. And um, they have had many opportunities to do it themselves. And I, I think what's being proposed is, is actually very. And I don't understand, I simply don't understand, as the mother of a journalist working in Syria, as a uh, widow of somebody who did an awful lot of journalism, I just don't understand. I just spent all afternoon with Stuart Purvis, who ran ITN, whatever, uh, real, real front line making decisions. I don't understand the language which comes from what was essentially an error in the first story. <coughs> So, I mean, I'm, I've now obviously put myself on the on the other side, but um, I have. Mm -hmm. George Orwell must be telling us, right? Well, you don't know that, I don't know that. Well, yes, I expect it. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, I am a large host, George Orwell. And it, he did, in 1984, uh, have a diary in a cupboard. He and was also in favour of absolute freedom of speech. He's particularly, not in favour of particularly in relation to the press. And for someone who comes from a normal society to defend what's being proposed by the after <laughs> Emerson is extraordinary. Can I say you are watching what happened? So I have an argument and I get attacked as well. I'm sorry, but well, you just you I'm just reminded you, you of I'm some of the things I'm reminded you of some of the things that Orwell said about press freedom. He was not two a, things in particular. He said one thing he said was that, yes, press barons do have an impact on how we can read. He said that, and would you tell him the other two said well? But he said there's something more important than that, which is intellectual cowardice in relation to freedom, and intellectual's abandonment of liberty. That's what he recognised as the key problem in relation to press freedom. The second thing he said in relation to press freedom was that um, you cannot have, it was that the key problem was conformism, actually. So I didn't yes. talk in my introduction about new laws that were going to tyrannise journalists, new laws that were going to stop you from writing what you wanted to write. What I'm talking about, but I did mention the word conformism, what I'm talking about, there is a very conformist climate today around what you can say, what you can write, and what you should think. He recognised that that was one of the key problems, and I think it's a key problem in relation to Leveson and the lack of inquiry that has been around it. Why do you make it evidence? Why do you cite evidence for this, for this idea? That the, the only conformity I see is the mass on this debate 
was the mass rounds of News International, The Telegraph, The Mail, The Express, The Mirror, The Spectator, if you count that. All saying the same thing, and all saying things that are false, at worst, and not evidence-based at the same time. So when you, I mean, I'm not an academic, okay? Well, if I were to contend with an academic, in my area, in clinical medicine, uh, which is, was my training, I would produce evidence before saying you're, you're wrong, okay? Thank you very much. Well, no, I'm, I mean, I've got my blood to raise some things, but I do, I do, I was hating the world, uh, not citing any particular project, but I was hating the world. Um, and you turned it into an attack on me. And that's really interesting. So, thank you very much. Lots of comments, lots of questions, so we're actually going to open it up to the floor. I'm sure it may, uh, again, uh, be uh, our panelists talking to each other, but I'd like to give um, you can turn it tonight, the chance to ask some questions, make some points. If you could just say who you are and who you're addressing, or whether it's all the members of the panel, that would be really helpful. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, that's fascinating. Um, and I'm quite surprised to hear that friends of mine talking, it sounded like a It's going to be very much restrained, I believe, by this process that is being set in motion. And I just want to clarify one thing. The idea that Leveson is going to suggest a kind of First Amendment style protection of press freedom. What Leveson says in his report is, which I have read, um, it, it will be lawful to interfere with the media insofar as it is, it is for a legitimate purpose and is necessary <coughs> in a democratic society. I'll tell you how that's different to the First Amendment. The First Amendment said it is never lawful to interfere with the media. It is never necessary to interfere with the media. Leveson says the precise opposite of that. He says you can interfere with the media when it is uh, uh, there's a legitimate purpose and when it is necessary. The other thing that hampers press freedom is the Human Rights Act. The idea that the Human Rights Act defends press freedom is hysterical. You look, if you read the Human Rights Act, which I've also read, unfortunately, it's a turgid document. Look at the qualifications it adds to every freedom, all the freedoms that we have enjoyed for uh, uh, hundreds of years in the modern era. It qualifies them all. You should have the right to press freedom, but it can be curtailed in this case, and in this instance, and when national security is threatened, when this is threatened, and when there's an outbreak of disease, blah, 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 all these qualifications about when it can be curtailed. So when I say I want a First Amendment stuff, there's no point saying, well, we have the Human Rights Act. That's not the same thing. It's no point saying, oh, well, Leveson proposed the First Amendment style thing. No, he didn't. 
In this country, the press, the problem with the press at the moment, and I'm sorry, you're not going to like this, the problem with the press at the moment is that it is not free enough. We need a freer press. We need a freer press, one that is not hampered by libel, the human rights uh, qualifications, or um, anything else. Those are things we need to What about dictates from editors and proprietors that say, thou shalt not you free press, you free journalists, write about this? What about dictates from proprietors and editors saying, there's no conscience clause for you as a journalist, as a free thinking individual, okay? If you don't want to do something because you think it's unethical, uh, you'll lose your job, mm. okay? No conscience clause. What about the situation where they say that there's no provision that they set up for people to report their superiors asking them to do unethical things? And there's a freedom for journalists, which is, all, which is ignored in, in your analysis, I think. And the only freedom for those who own an edit to say what they like with as little redress as possible. I presume if you accept some criminal law and some civil law, then maybe you don't, but, but, but clearly that's, that's still there. Um, but I just want to deal with, we don't have a constitution, so we could never have a constitution, a written constitution, so we couldn't have a constitutional amendment. But the Human Rights Act, I mean, say I, I don't have your critical literary appraisal skills to judge the worthiness of this language, but it it's, uses the words from the European Convention of Human Rights, which I think is, a, is an effective and a brilliant document that has done a huge amount to free people, and give them rights in countries throughout the world, expanding the world as we've gone along. And when the human rights came in, there were, there were qualifications added to the convention language, but only to give the press greater protection in Article 12. If you look at Article 12, it's not found in the convention, but it says you must have particular regard to the freedoms of the press. Okay? And it's important that that's done because you look at Hungary, you look at uh, some other countries uh, which are signed up to the European Convention, they're not there. But yes, I make no apology for the fact that we don't have a constitution that would allow an amendment, but I agree with Gene that, that in a, a first amendment that allows the Patriot Act is not much of a protection, it's an illusion. Okay? What we need is something that's actually effective. And to say that the courts cannot charge a thousand pounds for court records when journalists ask for them would not otherwise be illegal, but would be prevented by this. Uh, or that <coughs> the characters cannot subsidize competing newspapers that drive the local press out of business, which is not currently illegal, but would be under the sort of provision that they support for, is valuable. And I hope we will support it, because it's effective as far as it goes. Thank you. I know there's at least one more question. So. Thank you. Uh, questions each on the panel and the general subjects. So okay. Brendan, um, would you have any form of redress that you say this completely goes out and would private individuals who, for unfortunate circumstances, have any rights in this situation, which after all has got us into this position in the first place? Um, Evan, you talk about the one this is independent body, but how independent can it really ever be? Who's going to be on it? How would you appoint such a body? How far could it ever be politically or be other kind of forms of independence? Chris, cross me your own ship sounds great. Always says a wonderful thing, but your own party removed cross me your own ship regulations in 2003. Legislation within the government would really have the narrow state balls to do such a thing. Um, Gene, I just wonder, I mean, this is, I mean, rightly talk about questions about um, rights, common goods, things like that as well. Um, but do we actually really, I mean, I thought Edward Snowden's revelations are suggesting, do, is there such a concept as privacy rights any longer? Is this something that the horse has already bolted on? And well, generally, I was watching Maria Miller on Andrew Marr on Sunday, and she seems to be kind of changing the tune of the government a bit, which suggests, well, the press regulator that the press is setting up is going to be, well, we'll go by it, let's see how it works. And we're not going to really jump in with a recognition body. So what do we depend on the panel think is really going to happen? And also, the political will going to die away as close as we get to a general election as well. Thank you. I'm going to ask, yeah. going to ask you by Chris, Jean, Evan, and Brendan. Uh, can I just do the human rights thing? And, and, and Evan's right, we've not got a written constitution. I personally would actually prefer it if we did have a written country um, and can campaign for that for quite a long time and it might and it would be absolutely sensible that in such a written constitution we should have 
some kind of clause that reflected freedom of um, uh, press, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of uh, rights, family life. Uh, in fact, it probably looked remarkably like the European Convention on Human Rights written into the Bill of uh, uh, the, the Human Rights Act. If you want to call it a Bill of Rights, I'm quite happy for it to be called a Bill of Rights, but I, I, frankly, the, the European Convention was written by a Brit uh, who, in actual fact, was a fairly nasty man who went on to be Home Secretary back here around a very nasty homophobic campaign trying to catch um, uh, homosexuals in the 1950s here. Um, ironically enough, the first two conversations that they caught were Tory MPs. Um, but, um, and, and of course, human rights are always qualified. You have a right to a family life, but if you've committed a crime which um, uh, means you should be sent to prison, you don't get to enjoy your family life in the same way. Um, and actually, the right to privacy and the right to um, which I would, I would say that, that there are two fundamental elements of humanity. One is that we are intrinsically social, which is why solitary confinement is just about the worst form of imprisonment available. And secondly, um, we need a certain amount of private space, just physically, to be able to continue our lives. Um, and, which is why one of the forms of torture that is most painful is when you are deprived, you are entirely deprived of your privacy. Um, so, so, so of course you have to balance those two. That's what the Human Rights Act does, and that's why a lot, you know, judges in court decide the balance um, when when these are in conflict with one another. Um, I also agree that sometimes journalists should break the law. They should break the law if they're trying to pursue a story. I'm sure um, the journalists pursuing Watergate broke the law, and they they knew that if if they got it wrong and if it wasn't really in the public interest, they might go to prison. Um, and I, I want more journalists to be able to, to, to make those, be bold and be courageous and make those kind of decisions. Um, but, um, and that's why the Crown, the Crown Prosecution Service, and not a politician, I think, in America it's different, it is a politician, but here, the Crown Prosecution Service decides one of the reasons for prosecuting is, is it in the public interest to prosecute? And I think if it was a genuine public interest issue that was being pursued by a journalist, even if they'd broken into a house and stolen things, then I think they would probably say no, there shouldn't be a prosecution. Um, the, um, the cross